world news tonight. Trail of Destruction India struggles to return to normalcy following the deadly destruction caused by Cyclone Meshwam. Breath Battle Soaring pollution in Pakistan's Lahore fills wards with sick children. COVID Apology Former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson admits to making mistakes but defends COVID record at the inquiry. Chocolate Wonka a life-size chocolate statue of Willy Wonka bring it to life in London in a childhood dream come true. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin this Thursday night with grim updates on Pakistan's battle against pollution. In the packed pediatric emergency room of a Lahore public hospital, parents held sick children lined up for treatment this week. Part of a surge of young patients was caused by the air pollution crisis in Pakistan's second most populous city, Lahore. Health officials estimated there has been at least a 50% rise in pediatric patients due to respiratory issues exhibited by poor air quality in the last month. The city of 11 million, considered the cultural capital of Pakistan, Lahore, has been blanked by a thick haze that partially blocked the sun and shrouded streets with fog at night. According to Swiss group IQ Air, 24 of the last 30 days had hazardous or very unhealthy air quality in Pakistan's Lahore. Dr. Maria Iftikar, senior star at Sri Ganga Ram Hospital's pediatric department, said pollution has gotten a lot worse than previous years and that it is affecting the health of children. The UN Children's Agency says globally outdoor air pollution contributed to 154,000 deaths of children aged below 5 in 2019. In Pakistan, it is one of the top five causes of death among the entire population and young children are the most severely affected along with the elderly. Life was thrown out of the gear on the southern Andhra Pradesh coasts in India as heavy rains and high velocity winds triggered by cyclone Michuang lashed nearby villages, uprooting trees and electric poles. Michuang has since weakened significantly and has entered into a deep depression, leaving behind a trail of destruction. Let's take a look. Cyclone Michuang, which barreled through India's southern coast earlier this week, has left Chennai city waterlogged and struggling to return to normalcy. Authorities are trying to clear out rainwater from homes and streets in the city's suburbs. Some residents say they are unable to access basic necessities and are experiencing frequent power outages. At least 18 people have died in Tamil Nadu state, of which Chennai is the capital in rain-related incidents. The cyclone made landfall in neighbouring Andhra Pradesh state, where a child was killed and heavy crop damage was reported before the cyclone weakened into a deep depression. The heavy rains brought back memories of deadly floods in 2015, which killed more than 200 people in Chennai, one of India's largest cities, which is also an, an industrial hub. Experts say that many Indian cities are unprepared to deal with extreme weather events due to unchecked construction and poor urban planning. The busy Chennai airport was also shut down for a day after its runway was flooded. Dozens of trains were cancelled over the past three days. Local media has also reported that the economic impact of the flooding was expected to be severe as production was disrupted at several companies, including Apple supplier Foxconn. Today, municipal officials in Chennai used equipment to pump out water from the streets in the city's southern suburbs to allow vehicles to move. J. Radhakrishnan, the commissioner of Greater Chennai Corporation, stated that authorities had pumped out as much water as possible after 36 hours of continuous rain. He added that floodwaters had receded in three quarters of the city. Thousands of people were evacuated to relief camps over the past three days. Many were rescued from their flooded homes in rubber and fiber boats. Authorities are also trying to restore supply of drinking water in some areas. Over in Indonesia, the country's authorities concluded the search and rescue efforts following the deadly Merapi volcano eruption. The ultimately eruption claimed the lives of 23 people. Indonesian authorities confirmed today that they had ended a search and rescue mission for any hikers missing or killed after a volcano eruption over the weekend that left 23 people dead.
Mount Merapi on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia's west spewed an ash tower 3,000 meters, taller than the volcano itself, into the sky on Sunday as 75 people hiked in the area. Scores were rescued, but 23 people were found dead. The last yesterday evening in an arduous rescue effort, hampered by further eruptions and bad weather that sometimes forced workers to take shelter. Officials said that they believed every missing person had been located and evacuated, dead or alive. Despite initial fears, some may have used unofficial hiking routes and been unaccounted for. Hikers exploring the area must register with local authorities via an online booking system, paying a small fee and taking designated entrances. Agam Disaster Mitigation Agency official Ichwan Prathama said in a statement, quote, all victims have been found. The last victim was found dead. Therefore, based on an evaluation, the search and rescue operation led by Basaranas is closed. West Sumatra Police Deputy Chief Eddie Mardianto further said that all rescuers would return to their respective units. The head of Indonesia's volcanology agency, Hendra Gunawan, stated that Marapi has been at the second level of a four-tier alert system since 2011, and a three-kilometer exclusion zone had been imposed around its crater. He appeared to blame hikers after the eruption for going too close to the crater, saying the agency recommended no activity in that area. Indonesia experiences frequent seismic and volcanic activity due to its position of the Pacific Ring of Fire, where tectonic plates collide. Merapi is the most active volcano on Sumatra and one of nearly 130 active volcanoes in the Indonesian archipelago. Legislation that would provide new security assistance for Ukraine and Israel was blocked in the U.S. Senate today as Republicans demanded tougher measures to control immigration at the U.S. border with Mexico. The U.S. Senate blocked an emergency spending bill on Wednesday which would have provided billions of dollars in new security assistance for Ukraine and Israel. That's as Republicans insisted on tougher measures and more money to control immigration. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said in a floor speech on Wednesday that Senate should, quote, start meeting America's national security priorities, including right here at home referring to the illegal immigration at the U.S. border with Mexico. The bill, which includes $20 billion for border security, provides about $50 billion in new security assistance for Ukraine, as well as money for humanitarian and economic aid for the government in Kyiv, plus $14 billion for Israel. The final tally of votes was 49 in favor to 51 against, short of the 60 votes needed to start debate. Every Senate Republican voted no, along with Senator Bernie Sanders, an independent who expressed concerns about funding Israel's, quote, current inhumane military strategy. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a Democrat, also voted no so that he could introduce the measure again in the future. The stalemate in negotiations about Ukraine and Israel funding has been going on for weeks. On Wednesday, Biden warned that a victory for Russia in Ukraine would put Moscow in a position to attack NATO allies and draw U.S. troops into war. If Putin takes Ukraine, he won't stop there. It's important to see the long run here. He's going to keep going. History's going to judge harshly those who turn their back on freedom's cause. We can't let Putin win. On the streets of Kyiv on Wednesday, residents said they were worried and already felt the pain from delays in Western military aid. We already feel it. A friend of mine recently died fighting. We need to get the help as soon as possible. Every day of delay means loss of human lives. Yes, thanks to our partners, our defence is holding up. But regarding this issue, the congressmen need to speed up their actions because we all understand that we have less manpower than Russia. Congress has approved more than $110 billion for Ukraine since Russia's February 2022 invasion, but it has not approved any funds since Republicans took over the House from Democrats in January. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's chief of staff said on Tuesday postponing U.S. assistance for Kyiv would create a big risk of Ukraine losing the war with Russia. Ukraine conducted a major counter-offensive push this year, but was unable to break through Russian defensive lines. Russia is now on the offensive in the east. Israel-Hamas war updates now. 
Intense fighting is being reported in Khan Yunis, a city once considered a safe haven for Palestinians who fled northern Gaza. The Israeli military is now hunting down Hamas senior leader Yahya Sinwar after surrounding his residence. Fighting intensified in southern Gaza on Wednesday as the Israel Defense Forces reached the heart of the city of Khan Yunis. The Israeli military says his tanks made their way to the center of Khan Yunis and it engaged in what they said was some of the fiercest fighting of the war. Israeli offensives at the largest city of southern Gaza means thousands are now fleeing further south. Strikes were also reported in Rafah, where Gazans were told to flee by Israel. Upon reaching Khan Yunis, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Wednesday that Israeli forces have surrounded the home of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, saying he is hiding underground. Yesterday I said that our forces could reach anywhere in the Gaza Strip. Today we are encircling Sinwar's house. His house may not be his fortress and he can escape, but it's only a matter of time before we get him. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Wednesday invoked the rarely used Article 99 of the UN Charter to push for a ceasefire and formally warned the Security Council of a global threat from the armed conflict. In a letter to the UNSC, Guterres wrote that the armed conflict may aggravate existing threats to international peace and security. He added that he invoked Article 99 to bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter which in his position may threaten the maintenance of international peace and security. The UN chief went on to say that the world is facing a severe risk of collapse of the humanitarian system, with the situation fast deteriorating into a catastrophe with potentially irreversible implications for Palestinians as a whole and for peace and security in the region. According to UN spokesperson Stéphane de Jerich, the article has not been used for decades. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Tonight's Road to the White House next. Four Republican presidential candidates took the stage in Alabama for the four 2024 primary debate. Republican presidential candidates followed up a contentious two-hour debate by visiting the so-called spin room filled with members of the news media. President Joe Biden said Tuesday that he might not have run for re-election if Donald Trump had not entered the race. At a fundraising campaign stop outside Boston, Biden said, quote, if Trump wasn't running, I'm not sure I'd be running adding, quote, we cannot let him win. Reporters later asked Biden whether he would be running if Trump were not. I, I expect so, but look, he, he is running and I, just, I have to run. Biden's comments come as even staunch Democratic voters have expressed concern in recent polls about the president's age. At 81 years old, Biden is the oldest president in U.S. history. Trump responded to Biden's remarks, saying, quote, Somebody gave him a talking point they thought would sound good. Trump and Biden last faced off for the Oval Office in 2020, after Trump served one term as president from 2017 to 2021. Biden's aides increasingly regard Trump's frontrunner status for the Republican presidential nomination as insurmountable, according to two of those Democrats who declined to be named. Recent polling has shown Trump leading Biden in hypothetical matchups in key swing states, and on the national level. The group of seven major economies held a virtual meeting and issued a statement of a range of global issues. Among them, they condemned North Korea's recent launch of a spy satellite and agreed on a new import ban for Russian diamonds. The leaders of the group of seven countries, including the United States, Britain, France, Germany, Canada, Italy and Japan, held a virtual meeting on Wednesday to address some pressing international issues. The leaders strongly condemned North Korea's November 21st spy satellite launch, as well as suspected arms transfers to Russia, which directly contravene UN Security Council resolutions, banning the North from conducting any launch, using ballistic missile technology and engaging in any arms trade. The G7 leaders also reiterated their call for the complete, verifiable and irreversible dismantlement of all North Korea's weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles. 
During their virtual talks, the leaders were also joined by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and in a show of solidarity agreed to a new import ban on Russian diamonds. According to the statement, under the new measures, G7 leaders will introduce restrictions on non-industrial diamonds from Russia by January 1st to curtail revenue that Russia can use to fund its war with Ukraine. The move is expected to be followed by another phase of restrictions on the import of Russian diamonds processed in third countries, with March 1st set as a target date for its implementation. The policy includes plans to introduce a robust traceability-based verification and certification mechanism for rough diamonds by September 2024. The G7's ban on Russian gems, however, does not include diamonds for industrial use, nor the tracing of polished stones. On the Israel-Hamas war, G7 leaders urged for the immediate release of all remaining hostages without preconditions. They added that more effective action is needed to limit the displacement of mass numbers of civilians, also expressing support for further pauses in the fighting to get more aid to address the deteriorating humanitarian crisis in Gaza. To end further bloodshed, G7 leaders reaffirmed their support for a two-state solution that would enable both Israelis and Palestinians to live in a just, lasting and secure peace. Amnesty International revealed in a report that members of the Iranian security forces raped and used other forms of sexual violence against women and men detained in the crackdown on national-wide protests that erupted in September of 2022. With cases in more than half of Iran's provinces, the report expressed fear that these documented violations appeared part of a wider pattern. Sexual violence weaponized to crush the uprising. The assessment from Amnesty International on Iran's crackdown on nationwide protests challenging decades of oppression and gender-based discrimination. Amnesty says brutal sexual punishment was used with impunity against women, men and children as young as 12 across 17 provinces in Iran following the death of Masa Amini in September 2022. In a 120-page report, it documents accounts of 45 survivors and previous detainees who recounted scores more cases in prison. The harrowing testimonies point to a wider pattern of sexual violence as a key weapon in the repression of protests and suppression of dissent to cling to power. Iran's prosecutors and judges were not only complicit by ignoring complaints of rape, but also used torture-tainted confessions to bring spurious charges against survivors and sentence them to imprisonment or death. Amnesty International shared its findings with Iranian authorities last month, who did not immediately respond. The report comes four days before the award ceremony for this year's Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. The winner, Iranian women's rights campaigner Nargis Mohammadi, remains in prison in Tehran. Her children will receive the award in her place. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson defended his handling of COVID-19 at a public inquiry into the pandemic, saying his government got some things wrong, but did its best. Boris Johnson had managed to avoid them going in. He got to the inquiry at seven in the morning, three hours before it was due to start. And so he managed to avoid those who had been outside, representing families of those who died during COVID. Of course, Britain's toll in the first year of COVID was terrible, one of the worst in Europe. Boris Johnson copped a lot of flack for not locking down sooner. This is the first time he's been grilled at this inquiry, and he admits the government's response was bewildered and incoherent in the early days. He also conceded he didn't read much of the scientific advice that was prepared for him, and is also presented with a comment where he himself said in one meeting, why are we locking down for people who are going to die anyway. It's pretty callous stuff and he didn't deny saying that. But he also offered up early on an apology for the government's mistakes and that was when the protesters stood up. Sit down. Of please, the please stop. COVID Johnson. victims. Please sit down. Please sit down or I'm afraid you'll have to leave the hearing room. I'm sorry, if you don't sit down, I'm going to ask the ushers to get you to leave. Right. Could ushers, please, could you ask them to leave? I am deeply sorry for the pain and the loss and the suffering of those victims and, and their families. The four protesters were holding up signs saying the dead can't hear your apologies. Boris Johnson has left that inquiry. He'll return tomorrow. But as he left, he was greeted with booze.
Russia is set to hold a 2024 presidential election in March next year. For more on that story and more, let's take you on the world to the Russia's upper house of parliament voted to set the date for Russia's presidential election for March 17, 2024, and the decision was passed unanimously by 162 votes in the Federation Council. Top European Union officials met Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing for their first in-person summit in four years to discuss issues ranging from trade imbalances to Ukraine with an agenda full of tough rhetoric but light on deliverables. Former Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori, who was serving a 25-year prison term for human rights abuses during his decade-long rule in the 1990s was released yesterday despite criticism from an international human rights court. NASA officials and ISS crew members celebrated the 25th anniversary of the International Space Station with a live talk between astronauts in space and officials at the Johnson Space Center. A shooting in the main campus of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, left at least three people dead before the bloodshed ended when the suspect was shot dead by police. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we are leaving you in the UK as a life-size chocolate statue of Willy Wonka was unveiled in London. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.